how do we make money nowadays? That's what I kind of want to talk about. Anna, you're an artist. How do you make money? Well, <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, I have found that for me, mostly live has been the biggest revenue for me at the moment, um, above sort of streaming and, yeah, and my music being bought online. Um, but yeah, but I have recently just, um, yeah, signed and getting my first bit of funding from Cobalt, which is fabulous. I know some of you are here. Um, so thanks for that. Um, and yeah, and, so and just signing a little sync deal in the States. So that's going to really help. But I've been poor for a long time and I still don't have a home. So <laughs> I'm in between. I hear you. And what kind of, so you've got some money from Cobalt, publishing side, record side, what's Broadly, what are they paying for your skills for? What, what, is it publishing? Records? Um, what, for the, for the sync? Uh, not for the sync, but for the... You said you had a bit of money from Cobalt. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's a distribution deal, and yeah, which is brilliant and really, really helps because sort of up until that point, I was sort of balancing having to have a, a day job that you don't really want to be doing in order to, yeah, to pay to go on tour and to make the records and um, so yeah, so that's just gonna be hugely, hugely helpful and help balance my time a bit more, you know, because at the moment it's divided into many different sections with, yeah, with touring and creating, uh, yeah, and then managing the business side and self-funding. And is that the fundamental trade-off for an artist, that time is the thing you can't get enough of and money sometimes helps buy you time by having other people? Yeah, 100% and, I think that balance for me has been something that I've really struggled with, you know, because when I first moved to London, it was the first time that I was having to engage with that business side, whereas I just sort of spent nine months traveling around the world writing music, and, and that was going to be my focus. And then I came to London, and I was like, right, it's time to get the business hat on. Um, and, and that drive to sort of see my career move forward very much, I very much found that most of my time sort of moved over onto the business side of things, just with, yeah, going to networking things and conferences like this to make those connections that you do really need that lead to getting management and agents. And, um, yeah, so it's still something that I really, you know, struggle with, but I'm starting to get a little bit more regimented with, yeah, trying to even out the time on both sides. Gotcha. And Claire, from a communion point of view, what is it that you guys do... I guess probably overall, but then also, how do you make money for your artists? Where's, where's most of the money coming from? Um, so Communion is a 360 company, but a real 360 company, not a label who stopped making money off uh, record sales. I started to grab a percentage of income of things that they have nothing to do <laughs> with. Um, so we have a publishing... We started as a, as a promoting company, uh, and from the promotion side, we started working with artists that we really loved so much that we decided to create a record company. And then a publishing company came off the back of that because some of the artists we, we wanted to put on the record company weren't ready yet. So opening up a small publishing company meant that we could support them by giving them money through that um, without necessarily needing them to release something right there and then because we still saw talent in them. And most of the artists that we uh, sign are very talented. Well, we look for singer-songwriters and really good songwriting, so it makes sense to have the publishing as part of that as well. Um, so some of our artists, we just promote. Some of them we do all three. Some of them we just do um, two of the three uh, elements. And it just really helps when uh, we, we work with... Um, relatively large, developing and developed artists, but a lot of emerging talent as well. That's where we started from, really helping um, really helping artists that were right in the beginning of their career to get their foot into the industry and to create and help them fill the, uh, kind of create a fan base. And when you're, that's, when you're trying to help artists that nobody else really wants to touch because it's the bit where there isn't a lot of money to go around, being able to represent all three parts of um, the industry re is really, really helpful. Because obviously, when we start, and we, the very beginning of the touch point is potentially we'll put you on our, our club night. It's the first Sunday of every month. It's been going for 10 years. It's where the company started. And based on whether you, you know, whether we feel like there's potential there, we might offer you a support slot in one of the many um, headline shows that we put on. If that works, we might put you on the headline. If that works and we start to get excited, we might do a singles deal with you or we might do an album deal. And since we're working with, you know, artists where the, the margins are so tiny, being able to help you and 
create all these opportunities for you when basically in the start, as um, anyone who's been a DIY artist knows, at the start, like every little bit is just a struggle. And so being able to represent all of that and to help you across the different bits. And we also have uh, Maz who's on Radio X, which is very helpful. Um, all of that kind of means that we can create a, a sustainable model for people to develop and get to a place where you actually do start making money both for you and for us, because in the beginning, it is very, very small margins. Uh, absolutely. So Rich, from the sync point of view, I guess everyone's familiar with kind of the John Lewis Christmas advert that obviously lands a load of fans, a load of attention for an artist. In terms of kind of emerging talent, um, so one of my, sorry, I'm gonna digress and come back to my question. One of the big concerns for me is attracting talent into the music industry, one but also then how we progress it through. And Claire's just kind of described their, their funnel and how it kind of works from their perspective. Particularly from a, a Warner point of view, how are you helping the emerging talent break through? Because I say, John Lewis, everyone sees it, everyone gets it. It kind of it serves a big audience and a big purpose. How are you using Sync to benefit long-term sustainable career? Um, it's a good, it, the, there's all, the thing with sync, which, which is something that we, we battle all the time, is the promo versus revenue argument. So to what extent you're prepared to give somebody your music in their communication, whatever it is, that then helps that band's career. But you know, for every John Lewis, there are hundreds of ads that don't move the dial, loads of films that don't move the dial, that barely kind of blip. You know, we do, I don't know, 60 sync deals a month maybe across different kind of sectors, you know. So it, for us, it's, it's largely about ge generating revenue for artists because particularly as, you know, in the, in the UK, because the, the broadcasters have a blanket license so they can use whatever they like. So we, we focus a lot on advertising because that's, you know, where a lot of the revenue is for artists. And, you know, I firmly believe, and I guess I should if I work for a record label, is, you know, if, if an artist is lending a brand their art to promote that brand and drive sales of that brand, then they should be remunerated accordingly. You know, a lot of the things we do in music is we give away value in the name of promo. And back in the day when that converted to a 12 pound album, then I guess that was happy days. But um, it's so, you know, we give away our audiences in the name of promo and it doesn't convert into revenue. So, so Sync is one of the things that we, we're quite strict upon thinking that artists should be remunerated for it. So whilst there is a pro and mobile argument, so some of those smaller deals, you know, that, that don't necessarily move the dial for an artist, but they do for the brand, you know, that a lot of, you know, John Lewis is a, is a unique thing, a unique phenomenon, or certainly was. Um, but all John Lewis care about is their Christmas sales in the store. They don't give a shit about the song. You know, they like the fact that they're attached to it, but of course their business is selling stuff in John Lewis. So you know, the fact that we can kind of sometimes partner with those brands and, and help a career is, is important, and we do that, but ultimately, I think, you know, artists need to be remunerated for lending their work to somebody to sell shit. Absolutely, so for, for the young artists in the room then, would you turn down, it's hard and hypothetical, but have you lost deals because you stick to your guns on revenue at that low end? Um, not really, it, uh, we, we tend to want to get stuff done, and we do everything, we know artists almost always have an approval on anything we do. And we believe, certainly I believe that and, and, and my team do at uh, letting the artist see the deal and having that say, you know, we can advise. But if an artist goes, you know what, I really want to do this and I want to do it for nothing or practically for nothing, then we support that and we advise. And there are cases, you know, that, that make, that do make differences, and, you know, and, and whilst we have, you know, Coldplay and Led Zeppelin's on our catalog and, and that's a different conversation, there are loads of artists where those things are meaningful, and so we're always open to that conversation. It's just a, a value exchange, you know, and as long as there's value for the artist, then it's, it's worth a conversation. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And then Alex, at the other end of the spectrum, but in a similar field and on the same sofa. Yeah, it's because um, I come at it from the brand value perspective, obviously. Um, so Splendid is a, a communications agency, and... Um, we work, we've worked with loads of brands. I don't want to give too much away from my talking a bit, but um, we've worked with loads of brands in music since we were formed as an agency. So we've got huge amounts of experience on the other side where we try to evaluate how to get the most meaningful um, uh, ROI or benefit to the brand. Now, I think when it comes to the making music side of it, I think artists can do a lot more to make themselves visible um, as brands that they may want to work with and partner with. And I know that 
just to give you some, um, some context, when we're looking at artists that we may want to work with on a piece of live content, on a, on a piece, or maybe fund a music video, maybe even just help, help out a tour to elevate the, the, the room size a bit, get them more um, uh, visibility. We don't just simply look for the music they make. We look for their point of view, their, um, their attitude, um, a lot of the time their aesthetic. And so I think as, as young artists, thinking about the fact that everything is a brand for good or shit, it's way, that's the way it is. And I know a lot of artists are like, no, I'm just all about the music. If, 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 you're, if you're serious about finding these platforms where you can get paid for extra visibility, and I know that there's always a discussion about value, but um, I think thinking about other ways that you can make yourself attractive and appealing to brands that may want to work with you is, is a really, um, good way to start thinking about how that can stretch. Definitely. And Anna, do you want to chat? You did some stuff with Levi's, right, at one point? Um, yes. Sorry, that wasn't really a question. How was it for you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. They were asking, they wanted normal girls. So I was like, yeah, okay, I'll do it. Um, but no, but it was great. Uh, that was last year, and it was, I basically sort of auditioned to be in it through a, a friend that sort of put me forward. And yeah, and so I ended up being in that campaign, which was wonderful, but then they sort of asked if I wanted to write a piece of music and they pitched it to them. And so that, I don't make dance music, I'm a, yeah, I'm a singer songwriter, but I sort of wrote that piece for them and, and they chose that. So for me, sort of, uh, you know, having only released one EP at that time to be affiliated with a brand like that was brilliant because, you know, you know like we're discussing in the early days and it's really hard to get people to pay attention to you if they recognize something, then they're like, oh, well, maybe they are good because they can affiliate it with something they recognize. So mm -hmm. that, for me, was incredibly helpful just when it came to just adding it to my bio of things that I've done. So, yeah, it was hugely useful for me, and it's not something that, you know, I, would, I don't think artists can really stick their noses up at it either. I mean, it's a new platform to reach a fan base that you maybe wouldn't otherwise necessarily either, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, Alex, in terms of what you look for then, is there a, a top three? I mean, again, every situation is different, so it's always hard. And you're going to go through what JD rocks in some detail later on today. Hint. Um, promo there. Everyone get that later on. <laughs> He's talking about this again. But essentially, is there a top three? Is there three things without which you can't do a deal? Let's do it that way. Um, the first thing I'd say is a fine balance between being open to collaboration and then being a bit of a slave to it. There are some artists who will be drinking Red Bull on stage one week and then wearing Doc Martens the next and then crowd surfing with Converse the next. And uh, I mean, some of it might be completely genuine, just fandom, but you know, if you, if you as, a, um, as a music fan, you see an artist you love going too far with being open to that sort of stuff, it can actually deter you. As a brand and as a music fan, from doing anything with that artist again, it's selling out in a non-directly selling out way. Yeah, it feels diluted that they feels massively it wasn't special. It's just exactly right, and and that's what we look for with 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 um, with Jack and in the past with with other collaborations that we've we've developed is um, is is the, is a kind of a word integrity and credibility. I guess they're the main things. Is is it is it an artist that has changed their approach to music three times in three years? Or is it an artist that has done their time, sticky floors, done the circuit, developed, they started getting buzzed, they've built their fan base, it's authentic, it's real. That's the sort of stuff that brands like to, um, to work with, even though, I know that sounds so counterintuitive, and there are some brands that don't believe in that. There are some bands that will quite happily put some Japanese electronic logo on the main stage at Reading, and they think that that does a job for them. Um, but really where it comes to life is when you find partnerships and brands and artists that can all come together that share something. Sometimes you can't really put your finger on it, but they just feel right. So I'd say don't try to engineer your aesthetic persona or the stuff that you share online at all because you can spot when it's that, um, that transparent. Just be honest and be authentic and stand for something and stick to that. Um, and a brands will, as you develop, brands will naturally align themselves with that. I was waiting for someone to jump in, but no one's going to jump in. No opinions? Everyone's happy? It's going to be one of those panels where I have a conversation with each of you one by one. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a question in the audience? Sure. Uh, sorry, Devante, there's a mic just coming for you. Hello, everyone. My name's Devante. Uh, 
My question is for you. I missed your name, sorry. Rich. Rich, Rich pleasure to meet you. Uh, this has to do with in the atmosphere of promo versus revenue. When you are asking an artist to give their content in exchange for visibility, uh, what are usually the terms? Is it exclusive, non-exclusive? How much are they giving? How much skin is involved in taking that kind of deal? Well, it, I mean, it really varies from deal to deal, and almost every one of them is different. Uh, brands look for different things. Uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's very loose. We've done really kind of all, you know, heavily tied in exclusive deals with, 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 with brands and with, with advertising, and then we've done lo lots of transient things that are, that, are, that are quick. So it really, really depends. And again, like, you know, the value exchange is that I think, you know, the more that, that somebody's asking of that artist and of that music, the more they should be remunerated, you know, either financially or with, you know, whether it be promo in the loosest sense of the word or how that. So we, we think it, I mean, it really depends, but we, we you know, juggle those two things. I'm, I'm, well, we were, I'm a record label, so we we're a rights owner, essentially, so. Your, your interest is about the interest of your IP, the catalog, but how do Correct. you have a good relationship with a brand or a platform who wants to license the song, and they're saying, hey, we want this artist, we love this, but we, we're not going to give you $20,000 for both sides, et cetera. Yeah. Said, we want to use this song for free. How do you keep a, a fine balance between protecting your The relationship. Yeah, th there's a point in which we can't keep them happy, I guess, you know, because as I said, everything that we do has the artist's approval and we have that conversation with the artist. So if the artist goes, no way, why should I give them my music for free? I don't see anything in this, then we're not going to do that. And, you know, we'll politely explain to the client that the artist does not wish to do it. And, you know, as much as we, you know, value, very much value our, you know, our relationships with clients, our, our duty is to our artists ultimately uh, sorry so the um but f fundamentally you've got to trade that off right that you've got an artist who's got their integrity keeping that integrity is important you've got to wait for the right deal sometimes you just say no absolutely yeah sometimes you have to if and if it's not right and you know uh, as you were saying the authenticity is a massive part of what makes it a success for both the brand and the artist and if it does look forced and and tacked on then it looks shit for, for both parties. So, you know, whilst there is a value in it, but yeah, you, you know, we are, our artists say no all the time. I think it's a good thing. You know. um, other question on the audience? Any on this side? None on this side. I've got a question. Oh, we've got a question, sorry. Hi. Um, I don't know how you'll answer this, but if you weren't signed to a record label, so I'm a manager, how would your artist go about getting brand deals without a record label? Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, no, Rich. No, no, sorry, I was going to go. Um, well, it's certainly easier for the brand. Um, with a record label, it's not involved. <laughs> um, catch that. Easier without a record label. We'll, we'll come back to that in a second, yeah. Claire. <laughs> okay. I'll, 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 we'll put that on the side. Um, really. That's good. However, however the, the, it is an indication that they are at a particular stage of a journey in their, in their growth as an artist. Um, but what I would say is, is don't, and I'm saying this from a brand marketing kind of agency perspective, but don't, don't be taken for a ride just because you don't have a label as a safety net. Um, also make sure that, um, you have, uh, you have some return for the brand. Like, like if, if you have a record label or not, if, if you've got someone that's able to drive those conversations on your behalf, you are as artists able to keep a degree of epistemic distance, like. You're, you're close to the negotiation, but you aren't the negotiation. Someone's doing that on your behalf, which means that you're able to protect yourself a, a little bit from, from what you get from it, um, whether you've got a record label or not, try and make sure that happens. But um, I guess making sure that, that, that the time at which you're making yourself open to partnerships and collaborations is at a time when you can demonstrate some return and value on that. Like, um, so if you've organically built up a really strong online community of people that love your music and you're selling out shows, even if they're just local shows, but they're great and there's a great energy and they would make a great thing to send someone along to capture content at, 
that can be the degree of collaboration. It, it doesn't always have to be John Lewis sync level. It can be it can be authentic and real and small, and uh, you know to get a thousand pounds of ad value off the back of a five hundred pound payment just to come and film your show. That's value for a brand, you know. So don't always think big. Don't always think that it needs to be this long drawn out. TV-based sync negotiations, sometimes it can be the smallest sorts of digital content collaborations. Um, I used to manage before as well in DIY artists, uh, and we uh, used Centric for our, our publishing, and you'd get, uh, we got loads and loads of sync. Um, so that's quite a, and there's loads of other people like, so Centric is, is an independent publisher, so they don't ask for the, you, yeah, for those of you who don't know, it's like a 30-day cancelable contract, um, and they're particularly good at sync if you have the right type of music. So obviously depending from artist to artist, you just have to kind of come to terms with the fact that some, some artists will make a lot of money with brand partnership and some things are really difficult to sync. So we had an electronic artist that was with a female voice, which is kind of perfect for fashion, and then you'd get loads and loads of sync off the back of that. Um, and then it's worth doing some research over the US because they have different people doing sync there and you can actually sign to multiple people all who are, would be pitching for you and if you have a good relationship with people who who just do a straight sync you might find that you can work it into a brand partnership in the next rounds if you're particularly quick at replying and clearing and approving brands tend to really approve that and then they'll come back to you for last minute um, opportunities and we found that we started making a, a considerable amount of money off the back of that thanks um Thank you. Do, are there particular agencies, though, that because I like <coughs> I think what you've said is really really useful. But are there particular agencies that you would target to kind of get like brand agencies, or would you go straight to advertising agencies if you're pitching your artist to? What, what level brand? of artist? Pardon? What level of artist? Emerging, but Stormzy was emerging. I think with emerging, <laughs> it's a lot about also uh, <laughs> getting getting your artist to create a network. Um, I think a lot of artists underrate how important it is um, not to just be um, trying to find collaborations or um, inspiring to find other artists that have made it and be friends with them, but you can save a lot of money and you can create some really cool content by having friends that are, um, you know, not necessarily just musicians, but also uh, designers who can create your artwork or people who are photographers, videographers, and people who are in the kind of up and coming fashion, people who do fashion, people who, you know, anything that's creative, when you, um, having that network around you, it just makes all the difference. That's kind of what communion was based on. It's just a network of people all in the creative space that were giving each other, um, or helping each other out, which is still how the company is built. And that's what I found working with developing artists, the people who have those networks around you, finding brand partnership with, with baby brands is really where you should be looking at uh, you know emerging yourself from but i think just uh, it's it's a resource thing it's really hard because there are shit loads of agencies of varying degrees and also you know the the what they're working on is quite transient and they you know change hands and the business goes different ways so it's just really hard because the challenge is just getting your artist on the radar i remember i went to um, ea games in los angeles to like to talk to them about our music for fifa and things like that and outside of her office was a pile of envelopes, this was a while ago, physical, of just out like that, just, and she was like, this is what I've been sent this week. And she's like, I'm not gonna listen to that. So it's the relationships and kind of, you know, it, it, it's difficult because it's trawling through a lot of stuff, but it is a resource thing. And, um, and there's, uh, yeah, just to build on that, I mean, there is a modern form of that, which is the emails that don't get read. And, um, and you know, it doesn't matter what level you are in an agency, you are, I mean, we have to make margins, and a lot the bigger agencies are owned by networks, which means they're not beholden to their own margins. They're owned by a massive network, normally out of Paris or London, which means they 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 are every single minute is 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 monitored and has to be paid for. So, you know, spending time, they're looking for the most efficient way possible to find the solution, always. Um, and uh, when it comes to proactively sending agencies, to your point, your stuff, it just it's very hard to get that heard because what will normally happen is, particularly on a content. A digital content, which is kind of where my speciality is, what will happen is you, you come up with an idea, you find the artist that you, that you want to work with or the show you want to film or even just the, the thing you want to create, whether it's for Greg's or John Lewis or whatever. And, um, and then the videographer will say, I've found five artists that I think would be perfect for this. You listen to the five that they give you because they're 
the people that have had the aesthetic vision for that content. And they are the ones that you're going to take the recommendation from. So actually sending it to me at, at, at Splendid or whoever at Adam and Eve DDB would be fine, but you're more likely to go to the people that make the content or directly to rights-free music publishers who you may be able to sign some sort of deal with to just churn stuff out, you know. But it's, it's tough. It's, it's really tough. And a lot of times, somebody just sticks something on in the edit suite. Like, th you go through all that whole process and, you know, you do the, like, all your research about your brand and what your kind of, like, what the values are and what sort of music appeal to your audience. And then the guy just sticks Coldplay on it in the edit. And that's the end of that. I think also just yeah, reiterating with what Claire was saying, you know, just about having that network is so important and coming to things like this and meeting people and sort of, you know, making yeah, genuine connection where, you know, if you're sort of coming out of that, yeah, that pile of emails, whatever, it's less likely. Um, but then also, yeah, like you were saying earlier about finding that sort of the kind of searching into your backstory and your bio and the things that, you know, that that artist cares about, like I really care about gin. So I had my, my... We work own. on Hendrix Gin, just to let you know. Do, oh, really? Yeah. Well, that's... Yeah, we'll chat. <laughs> Please don't mention um, to you. <laughs> See, it's so friendly. Um, but, um, but, yeah, and I... Anyway, I really like gin. Someone thought I, I was saying gyms before, but, like, the drink, yeah. Um, and so um, before I had management, I just approached um, a gin company called Mason's, um, and their stocks in, yeah, Harvey Nichols and other places. Anyway... Um, but yeah, so we ended up, um, they created an infusion for me and um, yeah, it's a little elderflower gin and that's, you know, something that, you know, I did by myself and um, so I think there are some things that you can, yeah, I think there's a lot that you can do on your own. It is, it's like finding that thing that the artist genuinely cares about and, you know, and then also that's also opened up me to a whole different stream of, um, yeah, sort of getting reviews and sort of press around what I'm doing in a different market altogether outside of, yeah. And then becoming the face of Hendrix Gin. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't sign that we off. Have a little but hat on top. top. Little yeah, hat on top. As, of the as long as it's got like a, a cucumber feather, wing. then we're talking. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, just to one final quick point on that. So, because there are two types of kind of collaboration. There's there's when music is to create an ambience designed to not distract from what's in the ad. And then there is collaborations where the story of the music is the content. Um, and, and they're two very, very, very different things. And the former is where the videographer sends you five links and you listen to it and you pick one. Um, or you work with a, a, a rights free music publisher or you go um, and, and work out some, some sync deal. The alternative is genuine storytelling. And I think someone's actually doing a session from The Orchard on that later, so I don't want to do too much on that. But, um, but like proper music storytelling is where you, you, you tell a narrative of how the, the artist and, uh, and how they've lived and what they've done that has led them to this point at which you're capturing a story. Um, that's where the really meaningful stuff comes from. Like the Levi's and Skepta stuff was fantastic, um, in particular, uh, to do just that. And that, that's a completely different kettle of fish. That's not finding some music to create ambience, that is, that's music storytelling. And that's when you need to find the authenticity, the values, and the integrity to, to come through. And that's really important to keep in mind when you're doing the deal. Because if you go back and go, well actually my brand values are this, this and this, and they just wanted some background noise, not only do you not get the deal, but you've probably You'd much rather be the easy to deal with person they want to go back to again who can be a quick solution after the editors put it on the thing and someone goes, oh crap, who wrote that? You want to be easy and accessible, right? Yeah. On storytelling, timing's important as well, right? The right thing at the right time, is a the right, sorry, the right pitch at the right time is a completely different experience to the right pitch at the wrong time. Mm. Yeah, totally. Because I think certainly in advertising, like a lot of people, are, I used to work at Saatchi and Saatchi and everybody like every label, every publisher sends you all their music. Every bloke who owns a guitar literally comes into the office on a daily, multiple daily basis. I'm not, like people would write jingles and send them to you. So like it's hugely competitive, but you are, the timing is so important because, you know, when you're making an ad, you suddenly open your mind to listen to influences. And then you probably, you know, as a TV producer, an ad agency, you probably make one ad a year maybe sometimes, you know, and you're only actually open to music for like two weeks of your 52. So the timing is massively important, yeah. I have a question. What if, if you are paying someone to just purely do a social post, like an Instagram photo, do you go via the label or do you go direct to the manager? Because technically, 
I don't know what the deal. Well, I don't know what uh, I don't even know what our deal would be on that. But I guess yeah. if it's 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 not necessarily a, it's n not nothing to do with music. It's personality based. Yeah, it tends to be management. Um, but normally, unless you're doing um, drink Vita Coco kind of thing, um, then normally there's some. That, in my opinion, there should be some degree of music wrapped up in there somewhere, which probably means it, it's it's a joint contract that's signed between. Um, the label publisher and the artist management, uh, but that bit specifically, I would I would m imagine normally is covered off by the artist's management. And does that is that growing? Image. Like just put full on, just straight out. We just need an Instagram photo, and we'll pay you X amount for that. Because Unfortunately, that it is growing. Yeah. Unfortunately, for the for for the sense of um, quality of content, because I think that um, I think just doing that and paying for that. I think a lot of people can see through it, unless so and so is a massive fan of Docs and has worn them for a decade. So Docs get in touch and give them a new line, right? That makes total sense. Yeah. It would look good in their feed. It makes sense. It's consistent. But um, to use the Coke Vita Coco example again, you know, um, uh, having the View drink Keith Vita Coco is would just feel like. I mean, they might like it, right? But it would feel a bit weird, and that feels sponsored and paid for, and people can see through that. Um, and and so, but it is. Do you know what? This is a bit about the business of making money. It's it's totally down to you if you want to make that choice. But just be prepared for your community, particularly if you're a artist with a with a point of view, to have that challenge. And what's the price of photo per follower? That was my question too. <laughs> it depends entirely on how you negotiate it. Well, what's, what's, a, what's a good price? It, no, honestly, it depends on the size of your audience. It depends on there are so many yeah, factors. Never audience. ever just fire off an email going, "I've got fifty thousand followers. Do you want to feature my brand?" Okay, engagement then. Number of likes to payment. What do you rate? It, it that's no, it wouldn't be engagement rate. It, there's so <laughs> many factors, and I don't want to go into it because everyone will start gaming the system. <laughs> that's our little black box stuff. Okay. Sorry. So so after five beers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is, whatever. Is there an audience question? I, sorry, I can't see anyone up here, but I can see a hand. Hi, thanks. Um, I was just picking up on Claire's point. If you are dealing with an artist uh, who is signed most likely to a major, then it's likely in their deal with the major they'll have two rates when it comes to the ancillaries. One would be the procured rate. So if you go direct to Warners or to Universal, the, the, the label will take a greater share of the income. Whereas if you go to the manager or the artist, number one, they'll be able to help drive the deal in relations with the label. And number two, the artist will get an increased amount of that fee. So, yeah, that's essentially... For what, sorry? For, not for a sync deal. This wouldn't be for a sync, no, no obviously. So anything that doesn't relate to you know, the rights that the label hold. The, the non-music stuff, yeah. roughly. Cool. Any more questions? Sure. I'm sorry, Mike's just behind you and coming. Run faster, Dan. <laughs> I'm sorry, for those who haven't gotten on, Dan's my youngest brother, so if you see me being unusually mean to him, <laughs> that is why. Thanks, Thanks Dan. Um, obviously, there's loads of musos in here, but what is a sync deal? Ah. Rich. Good question. Yeah. Um, sync is such a... I hate the word sync, even though it's my job title. I think it's a really meaningless word. But uh, it's essentially the, the kind of placing of music with a visual, usually, but it can be a radio ad. But um, it's a yes. synchronization, Sorry. yeah, is what it's short for, but it's just music being used by somebody else, another, another media. Stu. Yeah. Either way. Either. So you're not mean to him, really. You're, you're helping him out. I felt bad after. <laughs> um, I had a question kind of about Sync and Online, about we're in this world of exploding video where um, every YouTuber has a channel and, need, and often has music in it. Netflix is commissioning. You know, like, is that paying off for musicians? Is, is this explosion in video content that kind of needs a soundtrack? Is that creating real money yet? Because on YouTube, we talk about YouTubers kind of, are they paying for music videos? But it seems like there's lots of opportunity, but no one talks about it much, about how well it's doing. Um, it, it, it's from my experience, it's still being kind of hammered out. And the YouTube thing is a bit of a, a, a you know, I don't think th there's an old fashioned rough rate card for TV advertising and radio advertising and the online thing. At the moment, Netflix kind of buy out as if it's a film deal. So normally if you license your music to a film, it's bought out in perpetuity 
uh, and then so it's so bought out meaning they can use it as much just as they means like. you, they can use it like in, a, in an advertising you would have a, a year long term and at the end of that term your use of the music terminates whereas in a film you know the film sticks around in various guises forever so they, they buy out the rights to in perpetuity that the film can use those rights so for, for things like Netflix and Amazon Prime when they create original stuff they're buying out the track as if it was a movie at the moment so they've not there is kind of moves afoot to look at some sort of blanket license that covers those kind of streaming services. But at the moment, a lot of the content they create, they want to get, go onto other platforms anyway. So it starts on Netflix, ends on Sky, or you know, has a theatrical or DVD. So, it, but it's actually, and certainly the YouTubers and that sort of thing is something that we're talking about a lot at the minute. And you know, somebody might have cracked it, but I think it's still developing. And as media spend goes more and more that way, you know, and TV is 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 still growing, TV ad spend, but not at the same rate as digital. So I think it's still being sussed out, is, the, is my opinion. Cool. Any last killer questions? Tim. Uh, at, at the risk of creating a certain amount of tension on the, on the sofa, Alex, Do it. Uh, you, you implied earlier that it can be easier to operate with artists who don't have a, a record label. <clears throat> I wonder if you could expand on that and then perhaps we could give Rich a, a right to reply. <laughs> well, obviously it tends to happen at the earlier stages of an artist development. Um, but it means that y you, could, you tend to be able to have more open discussions about how what the brand is going to be able to do for the artist can affect the final price on the contract. Particularly when you're dealing with iconic global brands. Um, such as Smirnoff or Jack Daniels or whatever, um, it, 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 it makes the conversations easier about, you know, as a brand, you can see what we've done. Um, you know we're not in this music partnership game for the short haul. This is something that's been consistent and ever present in the brand. Um, we have X amount of visibility, X amount of media spend, or the content will be seen by a minimum of X many people who are this age, this location. These are the things you can do now with, and you have to do for my side to prove value to a client. So that, that, that becomes a, to, a <laughs> to an artist that has a bit more independence of the decisions that they make, what they, what they do with their music, that becomes a, an easier discussion to have. Um, I think, to your point earlier, the idea of promo expressing some value back I think when you're at the latter stages of a development as an artist, it's, it's, it's a borderline impossible conversation to have because that's just not the way that the record label sees it. Um, so I, I think we would never try and wangle that sort of deal for an artist that's signed with a label because there's a reason why they're at that point of their development and there's a reason why they are signed and therefore you know, the, the, the contract is the contract. Whereas an, an artist that is, isn't... Um, restrained by those sorts of conversations, we're just able to chat about what else we can do for them as an artist. I think if it is a, a brand that's not able to, to deliver um, any value or visibility, then, then I think having those sorts of conversations is a bit short-sighted, but for a brand like Jack Daniels in particular, when we do guarantee cert certain amounts of visibility, it, just, it is a conversation that we like to try and have. Rich. Basically, they're cheaper. I work in communications. I'm sorry, fans are really cheap and they'll take no yeah, money. That's it. And sign fans. That's why it's easier. No, no we, all, we always pay. <laughs> Let's just we say how it pay. is, people. Come on. We always pay. We always pay. <laughs> we love your always pay. There we go. We always that's pay. That's like, exactly what I was going to say. It just means we don't have to pay you as much if there's no. <laughs> Actually, nice I think, I think there's also, a... It's such a harmonious <laughs> discussion until that question. I so have good. to throw the bath so and water out with the baby uh, at some but, point. But, but Actually, do it much now. As, sorry. Do it half an hour ago. No. We've got to shut this panel down. Um, much as I think this is actually like not the tension, because actually there is an element of that. You know, not, I'm not saying obviously with your brands, of course not. But sometimes, you know, because the label will fight for the money. And so that could be perceived as difficult. Having said that, I think labels, particularly majors, historically have been difficult to work with because they're slow to respond. And I, I mean, I hopefully, we, we, we've worked on that a lot. And if anybody's ever worked with us, hopefully you'd have that experience. But it's something we've been really, really conscious to change, to add value as a label because we're not guardians and rights owners anymore because the media landscape's totally changed and the value of reaching people is m far more important than it was 20 years ago, you know. So we, we're aware of that. And labels, 
can be difficult and they can be slow. And I can understand the frustration of a brand waiting a week for a label to respond. And that, you know, that's unacceptable. And I think actually, you know, labels have definitely been guilty of that. And hopefully it's something that we're really conscious of. And publishers too. Publishers, in my experience, publishers can be equally as slow and, you know, and, and difficult. And they, they don't have a view of the artist's career as much because that songwriter might not be the artist. So they do tend to kind of, you know, fight for money. So I can understand his point in there, much as I would like to have an argument. Um, we will continue this in the bar later. <laughs> um, thank you very much, guys, for that really interesting stuff. Um, thank you. Thank you.